So welcome back to day three of the Glenn Symposium. We're really glad to have you with us. Our theme is convergence, deep space, near space, and aeronautics coming together. I'm Alan DeLuna, and I'm the president of the American Astronautical Society. And on behalf of the American Astronautical Society, we thank you very much for your participating in this event. Over the past couple of days, we've had some great discussion about the increasingly converging environments of deep space, near space, and aeronautics. So we will continue that uh, theme today, and I'm sure you will enjoy it and be entertained as well as informed as we go forward. I would like to thank all of our event sponsors, and those are Aerojet Rocketdyne, the Aerospace Corporation, Ball Aerospace, Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, Maxar, Moog, Taldine Brown Engineering, and our media sponsor, Space News. So thank you everyone at the NASA Glenn Research Center and thank you for to our planning committee shown here. And I'm gonna take a 10 second stop. All right, so we just had a little hiccup in our system and the broadcast did not start as we expected it to. Our little computer uh, had a little glitch. Half of the stuff nowadays is controlled by computer and the other half is by other computers. The day of uh, Dave is with us, but going on, we'll start all over again. So welcome to the third, <laughs> the third day of the Glenn Symposium. Our theme is convergence, deep space, near space, and aeronautics coming together. I'm Alan DeLuna, I'm the president of the American Astronautical Society. And on behalf of the AAS, we'd really like to thank you very much for participating in this event. Over the past couple of days, we've had some great discussion uh, about the increasing converging environments of deep space, near space, space and environment, blah, blah, blah. Deep space, near space, and aeronautics. Uh, it's really amazing how these things are overlapping and you're having difficulty talking about one of these environments without talking about the other ones. So, and we've seen this as we've gone through the past two days. We'll see it some more today. And we hope you are entertained and informed as you go forward. So I'd like to thank our event sponsors, Aerojet Rocketdyne, the Aerospace Corporation, Ball Aerospace, Dynetics, Lockheed Martin, Maxar, Moog, Teldyne Brown Engineering, and our media sponsor, Space News. We'd like to thank everybody at the Glenn Research Center for their great support in putting this together. And if you saw the last two days, and as you will see today, they have been intimately involved in putting this all together. And we have a rather extensive planning committee. Uh, they've all worked very hard and been directly participating in putting this uh, event together for you. So thank you to our planning committee listed here. So some logistics and reminders. We will take a 20 to 30 minute break each day. Uh, see the agenda, that's for me and Jim to go to the bathroom. Uh, you guys can go to the bathroom or have lunch, whichever one you want. Uh, we do have a Q&A tool that you can use to submit questions. Submit them via the Q&A tool and you can upvote the questions you want asked. We have a little up arrow or an up thumb that you can click on to try to get a question to the top of the list. Uh, remember when you submit your questions, a question is a sentence or two, it's not a statement of three or four or five sentences. If you're using Twitter or the social media, our hashtag is poundglenn2021. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as shown here. And finally, our session intros are gonna be very short, leaving time for actual discussion and questions and answers. If you want to see the full bios of our speakers and panelists, those are available in the interactive program. Scroll down in the program until you see the people's faces, click on the face, you'll get the bio. So at this time, I'd like to introduce today's keynote speaker, and that is Jeff Sheshel. Jeff is a former speechwriter for President Clinton, and he's a founding partner of West Wing Writers. I had to work on that so I didn't slur it up. Uh, he is a Rhodes Scholar and he holds degrees from Oxford and Brown Universities. 
and he frequently contributes to the New York Times and Washington Post. Now listen to the titles of these books and tell me if you don't want to jump out and go and buy them. The first one is Supreme Power, Franklin Roosevelt versus the Supreme Court, maybe appropriate for nowadays. And the other one is Mutual Contempt, Lyndon Johnson, Robert Kennedy, and the feud that defined a decade. They were both selected to the New York Times Notable Books of the Year. And having scanned through some of his next book, Mercury Rising, I will ask you to probably go and get one of those. Uh, he is releasing his, uh, he has just released his last book, and it's a history of the epic orbital flight that put America back into the space race. When John Glenn flew on February 20th of 1962 aboard Friendship 7, his mission was not just to orbit the Earth. His mission was to calm the fears of the free world and renew America's sense of self-belief. Through his efforts there, he went through what uh, John F. Kennedy called the hour of maximum danger. So we're very happy to have Jeff with us today to talk more about the namesake of our event, Senator John Glenn. With that, Jeff, welcome and take it away. Alan, thanks very much. Um, I, I'm, I'm so grateful to you and the American Astronautical Society for the, the chance to, to talk to all of you today. Um, I've been listening in over the last day or so. I caught the administrator's uh, remarks yesterday and I, I'm just grateful to be part of such an interesting program. And thank you also uh, to Jim Way for, for bringing me on board uh, to speak with you. Uh, as, as you indicated, Alan, I'd, I'd like to talk about this, this epic orbital flight. I know you're familiar, all of you, I'm sure with the, with the story. It is uh, one of the high points, certainly, of, of the space race and really of the entire history of America's uh, activity in, in space going back now uh, more than, than 60 years. Uh, but I, we all know that John Glenn's flight was significant, but what drew me into this story even deeper uh, and what made me want to write this book is that I really wanted to understand why it was so significant. Yes, we know that it was the first orbital flight for any American, and that alone ensured John Glenn a, a place in the history books. But the flight seemed to me, uh, as, as I read about it over many, many years of fascination with these topics, it, it seemed to me larger than that. And I wanted to understand why. And I think ultimately the, the answer, just skipping far, far ahead, and then we'll, we'll circle back and, and I'll, I'll tell a little of the story and then in the end leave some time uh, for questions. Ultimately, I think the, the significance of John Glenn's flight uh, is, is best understood when you think about this as another episode in the Cold War. And on a certain level, I recognize that might sound obvious. We know this was a Cold War struggle. We know that the space race was a, a race against the Russians and they were of course our our adversary in the Cold War. And yet, uh, if you're like me, you have a, a bookshelf full of books about space, and, and most of them, as wonderful as they are, uh, only barely reference the Cold War. And I have another shelf full of books about the Cold War, um, and they barely acknowledge the space race as part of the story. They're more focused on what happened in Berlin or what happened in Cuba or Southeast Asia. And these two episodes um, in American history were really seen uh, by participants at the time, and that starts with the president, John F. Kennedy, as part of the same struggle, as part of the same storyline. That is certainly how John Glennon understood it. That's certainly how the leaders of, of NASA and of Project Mercury in particular understood their work in that time. That space was, was another battleground in the Cold War, and that as John Kennedy put it in 1960 when he was running for president, if the Soviets control space, they can control the Earth. Those were the stakes as they were understood at the time. And that ultimately is the story that I, I want to tell. That is not just the backdrop for what it is that, that John Glenn did, but it is the reason uh, for John Glenn's flight and certainly the reason for its significance. So if we could move to the, the next slide here. Uh, thank you. Uh, you will all, of course, recognize uh, that man that is President Eisenhower. And this is a a press conference a few days after Sputnik became the, the first man-made object to, to orbit the Earth in October of 1957. And, and you can see by his body language how impatient he is 
with the questions that, that he was getting from the reporters. The reporters wanted to know why America was behind in this new era that was just beginning. They wanted to understand why we had not been capable of doing the same thing ourselves. And Eisenhower uh, is, is not just frustrated with the fact that America was behind in the space race. He was frustrated with the fact that we were having a race really at all. Uh, Eisenhower's instinct in this moment was really to dismiss what the Soviets had done, not just because, not just as a matter of spin, but because he really didn't actually think it was that significant. Uh, he wasn't so sure what all the fuss was about. He was sure that eventually America would be able to do the same thing. And on a certain level, he regarded it all as kind of a stunt. Uh, he was not interested in space, particularly Eisenhower. It's an irony, given that Eisenhower is the one who signed the bill in 58 to create NASA. But Eisenhower really had only one interest in space, and that was military uh, reconnaissance satellites. He, he was interested in the ability to keep an eye on the Soviet Union and guard against a surprise nuclear attack. But beyond that, he tended to regard scientific satellites, meteorological satellites, for example, as, as gadgets, as he called them. And the idea of sending human beings into space he thought was sort of kid stuff. It was sci-fi, it was Buck Rogers. It was silly and it was a waste of money and ultimately it might be a, a waste of human life. And so Eisenhower was, was not particularly interested in leaping forth into this new era, but of course he was not the only one with a say in the matter. If you could uh, bring up the next slide, please. You will see someone who was very interested in this new era and that was the majority leader, Lyndon Johnson. And he really led the charge after Sputnik to demand answers from the administration why the United States was behind, to understand what the plans would be to bring America back into the competition, not back into the competition, but into it for the first time. And he led hearings at the end of 1957, early 1958, uh, week after week, uh, speaking of what happened in Sputnik, uh, with Sputnik and with Sputnik II, its successor, which was much larger, heavier, and more impressive even than the first Sputnik, uh, describing them as, as a new Pearl Harbor. Uh, and he was not the only one who spoke in those terms. This was understood by many, not by Eisenhower, but by many as an existential struggle, as another manifestation of the battle between freedom and totalitarianism. And again, if the Soviets were to essentially have space to themselves effectively, the consequences here on earth struck Johnson and many others as extremely uh, grave. And so by the middle of 1958, the momentum had, had built sufficiently behind the idea of creating a civilian space agency. As I think many of you know, there were multiple space programs in the mid 1950s. The Navy had one and the Air Force had one and the Army had its own. And Eisenhower allowed much of that activity activity to continue within the military branches but he drew man in space, as it was inevitably called at the time. He drew man in space away from the military branches to their great frustration and invested that in a civilian space agency, a move that he had resisted, but ultimately Johnson above all uh, created a political climate in which it became essential and ultimately inevitable. If we can look at the next slide, you will see one of the men who was first in line uh, for uh, the, a role as an astronaut um, when uh, the, the, the word went out among the military branches that they were looking among uh, uh, for military test pilots in particular. And that was, that was this man. I, I, I think um, you all recognize him. You may not recognize him with that, that full head of hair that he had at, at 17. Um, but this is, this is young John Glenn, and even at this age, uh, even at much younger than this age, uh, which is 17 here, he was absolutely fascinated by flight. He was obsessed with it. He didn't have many opportunities to do it. Uh, he lived in a tiny little town, as many of you know. He lived in New Concord, Ohio, um, and a town of about a thousand people. And the opportunities for um, uh, a, a young man uh, from a, a modest upbringing to, to get up in the air were, were, were pretty limited. And his parents actually weren't particularly in favor of the idea either. They thought it was quite dangerous, which of course it was. And it wasn't until the eve of World War II in early 1941 that Glenn was able to get some serious flight training. And that was uh, by enrolling in the civilian test pilot or the civilian uh, training program. 
uh, the the United States was building up a a, a a cadre of pilots, understanding at this point that that war was was very likely and it would need them. And so Glenn was first in line there, just as he would be first in line uh, to be a member of the astronaut corps later. Uh, he didn't actually see combat. He enlisted. Uh, he didn't see combat until late in the war, until 1944. When he uh, was uh, was was dispatched to the the Marshall Islands, if we can see the the next slide here, you will see Glenn at, really in one of the happiest uh, moments of of his life, which was um, behind the controls of a Corsair, and uh, he had uh, worked pretty hard to to get this flight assignment. And um, uh, while he saw as as they all did. Uh, death and devastation around him. He also, to be honest, had quite a wonderful war. It was incredibly exciting. And I, I spent a lot of time looking through his diaries from this period at, at the Glenn Archives at Ohio State. And he really was having a, a wonderful time um, and, uh, and and was incredibly proficient and, and uh, won um, medals of distinction uh, there in World War II. And and when the war was over, uh, really his greatest ambition was to, to fly again in, in combat and of course got that opportunity in Korea. And what needs to be said about Glenn during this period is that he wasn't just another combat pilot. Um, Glenn was uh, a, a fierce and determined combat pilot to a degree that everyone who ever flew with him recognized it and talked about it and talked about it many years later. His wingman, in Korea, at least part of the time, was Ted Williams, the famous Red Sox player. And Williams said about John Glenn, he said, the man is crazy. The man is crazy. And you know, this, this struck me um, as I was beginning work on this book as, as a mystery I needed to solve. Crazy is not an adjective that, that got, got applied to John Glenn very often. He seemed the, the, the most uh, uh, level-headed guy you, you ever could encounter in any arena. And he was level-headed, but at the same time, as he talked about this period, he said, well, I, I wasn't exactly trying to win the war on my own, but, but pretty close. Glenn was the one who would take the greatest risks. Glenn would fly fastest and the lowest toward a target. And in fact, in, in Korea, he and his commanding officer were, were heading uh, toward an anti-aircraft position in North Korea and uh, taking so much fire that his commanding officer said, we need to get out of here. And Glenn actually disobeyed orders to circle back around and, and, and take another shot at the target. And instead, the, the target took another shot at him. And if we look at the next slide here, uh, you can see the results of that. Um, uh, this is Glenn uh, with his uh, the, the 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 tail of his panther and the hole. He's he's holding up his flight helmet, so you can get a sense of of just how big that hole is. And as you look around uh, at the the other damage, you see that is hardly the only hole in this plane. Um, he managed to get it back to base, and uh, he actually developed a reputation among his other pilots as being the guy who seemed to draw the most fire and come back to base with the most holes in his plane. Um, it's sort of miraculous, but also a tribute to his incredible skill and, and perseverance that he managed to bring every one of those planes back and never had, a, had even a, a slight injury as a result. So there's luck involved, but there's also extraordinary skill uh, as a pilot. In the years after the war, he became a, a test pilot and a test pilot of, of some note. In 1957, he set a speed record flying across the United States from LA to Brooklyn. He did it in three hours and 23 minutes. And he won uh, bragging rights for the Navy and the Marines. Uh, Glenn was, of course, a Marine pilot. Uh, he won bragging rights over the Air Force for at least a period of time. If we look at the next slide, you'll see Glenn in that jet. It is a Crusader jet. And uh, he's got his, his name here on the side of the, uh, on the fuselage. It says Project Bullet under that. That was the code name that he gave uh, this, this mission. And this photo and others like it wound up on the front page of every newspaper in the United States. And uh, if we look at the next slide, you'll see it, it made Glenn an instant celebrity. Um, and he wound up being invited to participate in, in the popular uh, CBS game show, Name That Tune. Uh, here he is with the little boy, Eddie Hodges. And they appeared week after week and they continued to win and, and Glenn continued to, to charm the, the, the country. And so 
Fast forwarding two years uh, to the moment when Glenn is selected as one of the Mercury 7, the first group of astronauts, Glenn was already famous. And his ease in front of the cameras, his confidence in front of the cameras was apparent from the very first press conference in April 59 when the astronauts were introduced. If we look at the next slide, you'll see a, a, a still photo from that press conference and read the body language here. I mean, you saw Eisenhower's body language in the press conference uh, that he held. Look at Glenn's. He is having a great time and he's telling stories and he's speaking with, with ease and comfort about his family, about his religious faith. Uh, he, he seems to hit every note on the register. Um, and the others are visibly uncomfortable. I mean, here you see Gus Grissom and, and uh, uh, Cooper laughing, Gordon Cooper sort of chuckling, but really they were deeply uncomfortable um, because this was not part of the deal as they understood it. They were chosen um, because they were the best test pilots in the country and they had passed these incredible tests that were imposed upon them. But this, this idea that they were supposed to now be able to perform like this in front of the cameras was deeply unsettling to them. And, and they worried that Glenn's celebrity was going to skew the contest. They had won one contest, which was be, to be selected as an astronaut. But now there was another contest that was, that was underway. And it was who was going to fly first, who was going to get the chance to be the first man in space if the Russians didn't beat us to it. So the tensions among the astronauts and the, ten, and the resentment that was directed at Glenn really began immediately. Um, there were other tensions in the program from the beginning, which were in a way more consequential. And that was the tensions between the astronauts and the flight directors and the, the, the senior officials at NASA. These were pilots. They were picked because, as I said, they were the best. And they wanted to fly the capsules that, that they would be riding. They were not interested in merely being passengers. But the bias at NASA among the engineers was toward the autopilot. And at one point later in the program, Glenn protested, look, you would never take the best test pilot at Edwards and, and put him in an, an experimental new jet and tell him to, to simply sit back and report on the gauges while the autopilot did all the work. That would be crazy. That's what the astronauts thought that they were being asked to do. And it was an ongoing tension really from the beginning of Project Mercury right through to Glenn's own flight uh, in, in February of 1962. Uh, everybody thought that, that Glenn would fly first. Um, he was really seen uh, by the public and by the press as the first among equals. He was certainly the most popular of the astronauts. And again, this photo gives you a sense of, of why that would be. Um, but ultimately, as many of you know, it was Alan Shepard who was selected to fly first and Gus Grissom second. And Glenn was asked to be the backup to both, which was a source of tremendous uh, frustration for him. It was a very dark period for him but also for the program as a whole. If you could take a look at the next slide, uh, the selection of, of Shepard and Grissom at the top of the, the, the flight order um, coincided with Kennedy's inaugural. And uh, at the time there was, a, there was significant doubt um, in the country and, and even within NASA about the fate of the program. Kennedy had campaigned uh, in, in 1960 on the notion that America needed to get into the space race for real for the first time, that it was unacceptable, that it was dangerous to be second in space because it would make us second in the eyes of the world in terms of science and technology, in terms of our military power, and in this larger struggle between freedom and totalitarianism. But Kennedy didn't at the time have a plan to make America first in space. And when he took office, he was immediately distracted by a range of pressing issues around the world. And uh, one of the men that he put in charge of, of answering these questions about the future of the space program, Jerome Wisner, his science advisor, uh, actually was, was uh, suggesting, um, not outright recommending, but at least putting it out there that, that maybe the manned space program needed to be canceled, that Mercury was uh, such a mess in his view and so far behind that Kennedy, at the very least, should distance himself from it because it was likely to end in disaster. And so there was a question about uh, Kennedy's level of commitment to the space program, no matter what he had said during the campaign. And it was really not until Yuri Gagarin in April of 1961 became the, the first uh, human being in space 
that Kennedy recognized that he needed to, to make a significant move. And that move was going to be to get America on the path to the moon. Uh, but before he made that commitment, he wanted to be sure we could get into space at all. If you look at the next slide, um, uh, you will see that first American in space uh, on the left. That is, of course, Alan Shepard. Glenn in his backup role, um, doing his best to, to be a good soldier here. But again, this was a tough moment for him. Uh, Alan Shepard succeeded in becoming the first American in space, but it was a suborbital flight. It was 15 minutes from start to finish, uh, up and down. Same thing with Gus Grissom that summer of 1961. So these flights didn't go very far in lifting the pall over the program or, or uh, doing anything really at all to uh, ease the, the sense of, of concern and outright fear in the United States that the Soviets were achieving first after first in space. Uh, and that they might actually go ahead and not just get to the moon, but build a nuclear base on the moon. This is something that was discussed frequently in the nation's press by leading experts. This was not just some lurid fantasy, but it was seen to be almost an inevitability. And so when Glenn was picked next, finally he gets his flight, uh, uh, he's finally selected um, late in, in 1961 uh, to go third. Uh, that was, in fact, uh, supposed to be another suborbital flight. But because, Gagar because Gagarin had orbited the Earth, and because the second Russian to go to space, Gurman Titov, in August of 61, uh, also orbited the Earth, in fact, did so for 24 hours, the, the orbital phase of, of the U.S. program needed to be accelerated. And so uh, Glenn would not ride a Redstone rocket up just into the edge of space as, uh, as Shepard and Grissom had done, but he would ride an atlas and he would be propelled into orbit if all went according to plan. But if you take a look at the next slide at the Mercury Atlas configuration, the Mercury capsule put on top of this ICBM, uh, it had been finally man rated as they called it. And yet, and yet there were all sorts of troubles with this rocket. And the troubles continued after Glenn had been assigned the flight. Uh, it went on and on. And uh, over a four month period, Glenn's flight was scrubbed 10 times, 10 times before the eyes of, of the world and scrubbed for a wide range of, of reasons. Uh, the the, the uh, fuel was leaking in the booster. There were problems uh, in the capsule. There were problems with Glenn's spacesuit. It seemed to be one thing after another and the weather was unforgiving. And it just seemed that it it was unlikely that the United States could, could actually achieve this. Uh, there was profound doubt. There was no sense that this was inevitably going to happen. There was a sense of, of, of doom, a pall that hung over the program and over the country. And during this difficult period, the tensions were rising within NASA. If we look at the, the, next, uh, the next slide here, you see a, a note card that I found at the Glenn archives. These are Glenn's notes uh, to himself before a contentious meeting on the eve of his flight. Um, and you see at the top here, he says, all in the interest of flight safety, not true. It's reducing flight safety. No one better able to judge that than I am. He had the feeling that NASA managers were making decisions uh, that ran actually counter to, to his safety. And at an angle on the left here, you can see how this felt to him. He said, felt we'd have help, never felt so alone and so many against, why? This was a, a, a very difficult time for Glenn, not just having to wait, but having the feeling that maybe not, as he had been telling the public, as he had told President Kennedy, who was worried about the flight, that, that NASA maybe actually hadn't done everything that it could do to keep him safe. He certainly felt that they were making decisions um, that were not in his interest. And as he sat and, and brooded, as calm as he appeared in public, he really had to, to reckon with the fact that he might not make it back alive. And if we look at the next slide, you'll see um, uh, another interesting, fascinating, and really chilling document that I found in the Glenn archives. And, and these are, are Glenn's uh, notes to, to himself um, uh, for a script that he recorded for his, for his children. Um, he says, if you hear this, I've been killed. And he goes on to, to talk about his, again, his faith and about his belief in an afterlife and the reasons that he felt that the sacrifice of his life was, was worth it. Um, it is a very frank document. And he did indeed make these, this recording and he made another for his wife, Annie. 
and he sent them uh, to them to, to be played if, if they had to be played. Of, of course, thankfully, we know uh, that they didn't. If we could, we'll, we'll speed through the flight here because I wanna leave uh, time for, for questions. But if we take a look at the, the next slide here, uh, you can see Glenn being inserted into the capsule. Inserted was a good word for it. He said, uh, you don't get in it, you put it on. Um, and in the next slide, you'll see at 9.47 a.m., February 20th, 1962, he finally lifts off. Godspeed, John Glenn, was the famous line of Scott Carpenter's, and Glenn is, is on his way. Uh, the next slide, um, you'll see how things looked on the ground. Uh, everything froze. Everything froze for the next five hours as America, starting with the president, and in the next slide, you'll see a, an image from Glenn's hometown of New Concord, uh, as America waited uh, to see whether Glenn could make it back safely. Uh, if we can skip ahead to uh, the uh, two slides, uh, thank you, one more. Um, you'll see an image uh, of uh, the capsule on its re-entry. And if you look at the, uh, when the, the larger parachute has been deployed, you can see that the heat shield has started to extend. That was by design, it was supposed to cushion the blow as the capsule hit the water. But one orbit into Glenn's three orbits, uh, uh, Mercury Control re received a signal from the spacecraft. And in fact, the heat shield had started to deploy, had started to separate in space. And if that signal was correct, then that meant that Glenn would burn up on re-entry. Uh, but the, the, the flight director, Chris Kraft, um, in the next slide, made the decision that Glenn should not be told about this, that, that Glenn could panic if he was told. Uh, of course, Glenn, like the other astronauts, was chosen precisely because he didn't panic in dangerous situations, but Kraft was asserting control and decided that the way to, to determine whether the, the signal was correct was to ask a series of indirect questions of Glenn. And so Glenn was asked things like this. John, do you hear any banging noises? Uh, which is really an incredible question to think of being asked when you're 100, more than 100 miles above the surface of the Earth. He didn't hear any banging noises. Um, but there in mission control, they were in a cold panic, really, and a fierce debate for the, the next two orbits to decide whether the signal was correct, and if so, whether anything could be done to save Glenn's life if it was. The next slide will show the solution, which nobody particularly believed in, but the solution that they came up with, which was to leave the retro pack, this is a prototype here, leave that retro pack attached by those three titanium straps. They had hoped that if they left it on during re-entry, which was not part of the plan because they knew it would melt, um, might just hold the heat shield in place long enough to save Glenn's life, but nobody was confident. And so Glenn at the very last minute was told, uh, John, we want you to leave the retro pack on during, during re-entry. And at that point, he'd been asked so many indirect questions that he finally burst out in a little bit of frustration. And he said, what is the reason for this? Is there any reason? And the answer was not at this time, not at this time. Even to the last minute, when they thought his life might be in jeopardy, they would not tell him why they were asking him to depart so radically from, from the flight plan. Now, of course, we know the outcome. Uh, Glenn didn't at the time. He understood something serious was going on. And as that retro pack began to melt on his re-entry and he saw flaming chunks of it, felt them banging against the side of the capsule, saw them going by the, the window, uh, he, he wondered whether the heat shield was, was burning up and he braced himself, he said later, uh, to burn. But of course, again, we know the outcome. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, you will see uh, uh, the, the, the celebration a few days later at Cape Canaveral, the president himself, uh, understanding the importance of this event, came down to, to celebrate uh, Glenn's return. And uh, I wanna, again, leave time for questions. So I will, I will end the story a little abruptly here, but if we take a look at, at just one more slide here, you will see uh, another moment that is, I think, familiar to, to everyone here on the, in this meeting. And that was Glenn's return to space at the age of 77 in 1998, a story we can discuss in the Q&A uh, if you'd like. So with that, I will wrap my presentation and, and be happy to take your questions. Jeff, really, thank you very much. Uh, the pictures were amazing and the narration was uh, even better. I do want to jump in with the, the first question regarding that last flight. 
you know, Jean Glenn bookended a lot of the American space program. He was the first American in orbit, then he was the oldest man that ever went to orbit. Now I had I still had a real job when he flew. And those of us in the program, when they first announced that he was going to flew, going to fly, uh, reacted very negatively to it. Uh, it was question is, you know, what kind of PR stunt is this? But then when we talked to him, I got the opportunity to speak to the Senator more than once or twice, and also to the mission designers. It actually turned out to be a really very beneficial and important missions. So how did he look at his last flight? How and why did he think it was important? He, he was absolutely earnest about the, the scientific focus of the mission. Um, he had been studying this question of uh, the effects of long-term uh, stays in space and noticed uh, in about 1995, noticed that the, the, the list of, of concerns and what astronauts, osteoporosis and other concerns um, were very similar to what people experience when they age. And so he had the idea that, that sending someone like himself um, uh, back into space at the age of, of 77, as you said, when he, when he finally went up in 1998, um, could tell us a lot, again, about the aging process and also about um, uh, the effects of, of, of space flight on the human body at, at various stages. So he, he meant it, although, although it is worth acknowledging that um, part of John Glenn simply wanted to get back into space. He had never looked at the Flight of Friendship 7 as, as one and done. And that was certainly not what the, what the expectation was within NASA or, or in the country. And it was a shock and, a, and a, a real disappointment to John Glenn that he was essentially sidelined um, by Bob Gilruth and, and the other NASA managers after his flight. And uh, they were trying to edge him into a desk job by 1963, 1964, which is why he left the program and, and sought his, his, his career in politics. So he always wanted to get back to space. And uh, here was a pretty good reason to do it as far as he was concerned. It is also the case that both Dan Golden and then the administrator of NASA and President Clinton, who had to approve the mission, felt that it would, it would be a big boost to the space program. The sense of excitement um, that many Americans were no longer feeling about the space program might be revived by uh, the return of, of John Glenn uh, into orbit. And it was an incredibly exciting thing. And it did actually bring the space program back uh, into the, the, the front of the national consciousness. So, and you just mentioned that he uh, didn't fly in the program again until shuttle. Um, there's lots of popular uh, thoughts about why he never flew again. Can you help us understand why he essentially failed in space? So he went and became a Senator, kind of a interesting backup plan. So why <laughs> did he not fly again? Well, there's a mythology about it, which is, um, that President Kennedy ruled it out because John Glenn was too important a national symbol to, to risk his life again. Uh, but Kennedy never got involved in decisions like this. Um, he certainly had a, a, a very uh, acute interest in John Glenn and, and uh, wanted John Glenn ultimately to run for Senate from, from Ohio. That was encouraged by the president and by Robert Kennedy. And yet uh, he wasn't involved in, in this decision at all. Uh, ultimately, um, there were probably a number of things at work. Um, and Glenn's willingness to, to speak up to, to the managers at NASA um, and to stand up for, I mean, you saw that, that note card that I shared with you. He was willing to, to really lay it on the line. And um, that was not much appreciated, frankly. And uh, a lot of them thought that Glenn had, had gotten too big for his britches. The response to his flight uh, maybe would make him even more so. And so Glenn was sidelined in favor of others who, who frankly were, were more amenable um, from the perspective of, of NASA leaders. And so, I, I mean, there's an interesting paradox here in that Glenn was by a long shot the most popular of the astronauts, you know, maybe ever um, uh, and uh, much beloved in the country, but not so much within the program uh, by senior managers. Uh, very much by the people who worked closely with him and the engineers and all the, the ground crew. I mean, uh, Glenn was a, a, a very kind person who shared credit with everyone who ever had anything to do with these missions. But the managers felt a little bit differently. Chris Kraft absolutely felt differently. And in 30 seconds, can you give us a, a parting thought about a compare and contrast 
World War II, John Glenn versus President Ford. Versus, I'm sorry? President, President Ford, Gerald Ford. You know, that, that's a fascinating question. I, I'm not familiar enough with President Ford's record during that period to be able to, to contrast them. Um, uh, but I'm happy to take a shot at another 30 second question if I haven't used it all up. I think I, think <laughs> I used it all up. So Jeff, this has been fascinating. I'm, I'm really glad we got you in. I'm, I'm very happy that our friends in Glenn were able to uh, encourage us to bring you. And so uh, thank you so much for what you've brought. It's now time to move over to our next session, which is Getting There Faster, Accelerating Hypersonics Development. So if everybody can go to the menu and click over to the next session. Uh, thank you very much. And Jim Way, my buddy from AAS, the executive director, who is co-hosting this event with me. We'll see you over there. Thanks, everybody.